Okay, time's up. Okay, so before we get started today, just um, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, first, on the sort of positive side of things, I am giving you an extra credit opportunity next week. Um, there is a guest speaker coming to campus, uh, Dr. Eric Spears. He's a geographer at Georgia College. Um, and he is coming to talk about uh, sort of contemporary issues in Brazil. Um, now, I know this has nothing directly to do with British literature, but it does have something to do broadly with making you more cultured. Um, and please put the phone away. If you're staring at your lap and giggling, I know you're looking at a phone. Thank you. <clears throat> Where was I? Right, Brazil. So um, he's going to be here next Monday, February 8th, from 4 to 5 p.m. Um, in the nursing auditorium. All you have to do is show up, make sure that I see you there. Um, I'll put your name down, um, and you'll get the and you'll get extra participation points. You also do get Windows of the World credit uh, for going to this event. So if this is some if we, if you are one of those who needs Windows of the World World credit, then um, this is a pretty good thing for you to go to. Um, secondly, um, look, you know, I'm, I'm looking around here and uh, it's clear that some of you still don't have the textbook, right? You know, we're a month into the class. Several of you seem to be completely unprepared. Um, and, you know, at this point in the semester, right, not okay, not acceptable. We're almost a month in. If you're whispering to your neighbor, what were we supposed to read for today? I know you didn't do the damn reading, right? I'm not stupid. I'm not blind. I'm not deaf. I will be less annoyed with you if you are honest about not doing the reading and don't try to bullshit me. However, if you actually want to pass the class, right, you're going to have to keep up with the reading. And if you are not willing to do that, you may as well simply withdraw. Right? If you're not going to read, you're not going to pass the class. It's basically that simple. Right? So get your shit together and keep up. Okay, so how'd the Mallory go for you? Those of you who did do the reading. I liked it. What's that? I liked it. You liked it? What did you like about it? Well, I mean, I kind of guess the connections with Sir Gwai and the night just kind of, it, I guess, it brought forth some incentive to read. And then uh -huh. the language wasn't near as hard as the previous reading. <laughs> no, um, we're, we're, we're dealing with something that's a lot closer, uh, yeah, to modern English. Um, this is not Middle English anymore. Um, this is modern English with non-standardized spelling, basically. And they do, they clean it up a little bit for you in the anthology, so it's not quite so difficult. So what connections then did you see between this and Sir Gowan and the Green Knight? Apart from some consistency of characters. Well, you have configured that. Okay. Explain, Mercedes. The comparison? Yeah. Well, in, in Sir Gowan, you have like, uh, he kind of like was cheating on the king, Arthur, yeah? as, uh -huh. as now Lancelot is doing it. Yeah, we, we had right, Gawain was sort of um, love talking in a relatively innocent fashion with his host's wife, right? So here now, here's more plan, let's say. Kind of like, Gawain was kind of like, um, like it was something, how do you say, like, um, I don't know this word. It was like a trick for him. Right, like, Gawain is being tricked, right? He's been, he's been tricked. In this case, it's different. Lancelot goes and looks for her, so it's kind of like they are both hiding the king. Yeah, they're, both Lancelot and Guinevere are complicit in this, right? Exactly. How else is the sort of the courtly love plot in this um, different? Uh, 
Well, he's a knight of the round table. Well, they, they both are, right? They're both supposed to be. They're both supposed to be. Um, Gawain and Lancelot are some, you know, two of Arthur's you know, best and most famous knights, right? Now, when we look at the Gawain poem, right, Gawain is supposed to be the greatest knight at Arthur's court in that particular poem, right? Lancelot doesn't enter into it. Lancelot doesn't figure in. Um, Lancelot is more a product of uh, French tradition. Now, to an extent, all Arthurian romance is a product of French tradition, but you know we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But yeah, Lancelot is a character who was actually invented by the French poet Chrétien de Troyes, right? You may remember this name from when we talked about it. Does anyone remember who Chrétien was? What other famous Arthurian symbol he invented? Yeah, the Holy Grail is complete, is Chrétien's invention, yeah. Right, sad to say, right, there ain't no Grail. It's made up by a 12th century French poet. And Chrétien operated in this courtly love tradition. Right, he wrote romances, he wrote po you know, short poems, lyric poems, in this courtly love literary tradition. So how else is Lancelot, Lancelot's affair with Guinevere different here from Gawain's affair with Lady? What are the consequences of Lancelot's affair with Guinevere? Pardon? Yeah, Guinevere almost gets burned at the stake, right? For treason. Yeah. So what ultimately happens here as a result of this little courtly love subplot? Pardon? Just about everybody dies. Yeah, just about everybody dies, right? The state under Arthur is destroyed. Right, the affair between Lancelot and Guinevere destroys the nation. Everything is unmoored, right? At the end of this at the end of this fight, at the end of this battle between Arthur and his nephew slash son, all the knights of the round table, but for a few, are dead. Mordred and all of his allies are dead. Right? The old order is completely overturned. It's gone. Now, some of this has to do with the times in which uh, Thomas Mallory, the author of this work, lived. Have any of you ever heard of the Wars of the Roses? Yeah, it's Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, that, that had to do with, um, does anybody know what heraldry is? Essentially, that was like, you know, if you're a knight in full armor on a battlefield, are your allies and your enemies going to be able to recognize who you are? No, your face is covered, your whole body's covered, right? So the way you're recognized is by painting some symbol on your shield or on your armor. So yeah, the symbols of these two warring families, and they're really branches of the same family, were a white rose and a red rose. So, to give you a little bit of background on the Wars of the Roses. Wars, plural, because this was an ongoing conflict that started back up. Um, now and again, right? You know, it, it, it would calm down and then flare up again. So we start in the 14th century with the English king, Edward III. Now, Edward III had five surviving sons, which for a medieval anybody is actually a pretty impressive record. 
right? But Edward lived and reigned for a very long time. So he had five sons. Edward the Black Prince, so-called because of his distinctive black armor that he wore. Lionel, the Duke of Clarence. John of Gaunt, who was the Duke of Lancaster. That's Lancaster in England, not Lancaster where the Amish hang out in Pennsylvania. Uh, fourth son. Edmund, Duke of York. And fifth son, Thomas of Woodstock. Okay, so who should be the heir to the throne, given our happy little chart here? Yeah, who's the oldest son? If we're thinking in terms of like medieval primogeniture, right? Oldest son inherits. So Edward the Black Prince should be the next king after his father. Right, problem for him, dies before his father. Father lives a very, very long time. So, Edward's son, Richard II, becomes king. Now in 1399, Richard is himself deposed by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, who's the son of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. Richard had no, um, had no children. Richard, by the way, was also the king um, who ruled when, uh, at the time Sir Gowdy and the Green Knight was written, and was also the king who Geoffrey Chaucer worked for. So Richard II, is deposed in 1399 and then sort of just disappears in 1400. And his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, becomes King Henry IV. And he is succeeded by his son, Henry V. Who is succeeded by his son, Henry VI. Um, Henry VI turns out to be kind of a lousy king, right? This is sort of one of the problems with hereditary monarchy, right, is that you, you never have any guarantee that your son is actually going to have the qualities that you need in a ruler. So Henry VI is opposed by his cousin, Richard the Duke of York. Now, Richard, the Duke of York, is the grandson of the fourth son of Edward III. So it would seem like he comes from a junior branch of the family, right? But his mother is the daughter of the second son, right? These kinds of in-family marriages were pretty common among medieval aristocratic dynasties to preserve their power, right? So that other people couldn't, uh, couldn't get in. So Richard, Duke of York, goes to war against Henry VI. The symbol of the Yorkists is a red rose. The symbol of the House of Lancaster is a white rose. I think, I might have the color of the roses mixed up, but it's certainly, it's definitely a red rose and a white rose. Right, usually, members of the same family had very similar coats of arms. Richard is killed, and so the fight is taken over by his son, who defeats Henry's forces and becomes King Edward IV. Not all of Edward's allies are happy with his rule, though, so, 
they try to promote a rebellion under his brother, George, the Duke of Clarence, who is apparently charismatic and good looking, but not especially bright. So George's rebellion fails. When Edward dies, instead of his sons inheriting the kingdom, they're conveniently put away by their uncle, Richard the Duke of Gloucester, who becomes Richard III. All right, famous from the Shakespeare play. Are we confused yet? Yeah, this is all a very, this, the, the, that's part of the point here. Right? This is a dizzying knot of difficult family relations, right? This is like a, a family feud that extends over a period of about 40 years. So Richard III, in 1485, is defeated at the Battle of Bosworth Field by an army led by a guy by the name of Henry Tudor. Now, Henry Tudor is a descendant of John of Gaunt by John of Gaunt's mistress. So he comes from an illegitimate branch of the family. <coughs> so the wars end in 1485. The Lancastrians win, ultimately. But they do so by sort of disappearing from history. The House of York and the House of Lancaster are both gone. And the Tudors will reign in England for the next century, right, into the beginnings of the 17th century. So Thomas Mallory, the person we think, at least the Thomas Mallory we think wrote this particular text, was a knight in the retinue of the Earl of Warwick. Warwick was uh, nicknamed the Kingmaker. in that he was able to successfully push Henry VI aside in favor of Edward IV. But when Edward wasn't nice enough to Warwick, when the war was over, Warwick is also the guy who instigated Edward's brother George to rebel against him. So Warwick had this reputation for being a sort of slippery character uh, who had his own interest and his own family's power um, in mind, rather than the interests of the kingdom. The Thomas Mallory, we think, wrote the Mort de Arthur. As I said, was a follower of this, this guy who switched sides fairly frequently, liked to be on the winning side. Um, and at the time he wrote this was probably a prisoner. Um, on a variety of charges, some of which may have been trumped up. Um, it seems that he repeatedly invaded and despoiled a particular abbey. Um, he was also charged with rape, although in the medieval's, in the me medieval terminolo legal terminology, rape doesn't necessarily mean sexual assault. It can also simply mean kidnapping. The record doesn't actually specify um, whether which Mallory was actually accused of. But what he seems to, what, what his real problem seems to have been was that he was a follower of a guy who became politically unpopular. And so we have this bit at the very end of our selection here at page 500. Right. For this book was ended the ninth year of the reign of, reign of King Edward IV by Sir Thomas Mallory, knight, as Jesu help him for his great... Oh, um, I pray you all, gentlemen and gentlemen, read at the book of Arthur and his knights from the beginning to the ending. Pray for me while I'm alive that God send me good deliverance. And when I am dead, I pray you all, pray for my soul. This was kind of an unusual way to end um, a romance. And um, indeed, like the earliest manuscripts we've been able to find of Mallory's work um, are signed 
Thomas Mallory prisoner. So we think that this Thomas Mallory who wrote this is a guy, he's the Thomas Mallory of New Mold Rebel. who we know was imprisoned during the ninth reign, the ninth year of the reign of King Edward IV. Right? All the other Thomas Mallory's it could be do not fit that particular criteria. Okay, so that's the Wars of the Roses. So we're dealing with, so this is produced in a period of incredible violence and political instability. So why might the legend of Arthur be attractive to a knight living in a period like this. You know, a period that is dominated by this, you know, war between different branches of the same family. What does the myth of Arthur offer that this guy might be picking up on. All right, well, let's maybe start with something a little bit more basic. What do you guys know about the broad outlines of the King Arthur myth? First question, was there or was there not a historical King Arthur? What's that? Pardon? You don't know? All right, well, let me give you some of the commonly cited evidence. This is Tintagel Castle in Cornwall. In tourist brochures, it is referred to as the birthplace of Arthur. And indeed, it is often referred to as such in Arthurian romances. So we have a birthplace, right? Here we have the site of King Arthur's tomb on Glastonbury Tor. Near the end of the 13th century, King Edward I demanded that this site be dug up and they found there the skeletons of a man and a woman. And so Edward ordered that a black obsidian, to, like a black obsidian tomb be built on this site. The tomb is now gone since the, the original abbey was destroyed. But so we had bodies, right? We had bodies, we had a tomb. And here, the pièce de résistance, here is the round table hanging from a wall in Winchester Castle. And we have the names of all the major knights of the round table painted around the edges of it. So how convincing is any of this? Susan Pretty. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> it may seem so, right? But all of this supposed evidence is problematic. For one thing, if there was an Arthur, right, the way he is depict the way he is depicted in the earliest tales, he would have been a fifth century British warlord. Right? <clears throat> the basic outline of the earliest tales is that he's the guy who reestablishes order when the Romans leave. So he sort of is the continuation of civilization. Any mention of Arthur in connection with Tintagel, right, the earliest one is in the 11th century in the works of Geoffrey of Monmouth. Geoffrey of Monmouth was a historian, um, 
I use the term historian very, very loosely because most of Jeffrey's history really is fiction. Now, Arthur's tomb, located in the 13th century, right? One, it took them a hell of a long time to find this, right? Guinevere herself, the queen, is a product of French romances. She does not appear in any, in, you know, any early British material. There's no mention really of a queen at all until Geoffrey of Monmouth again. And it just so happened that Edward I was embroiled in a series of wars with Scotland um, and was looking for a way to legitimize his own, um, his own throne, his own claim. So building a monument to the great King Arthur seemed like a pretty good way to do that. And if we look at this, what do we notice is in the middle of the table? What emblems do we have here? Can you tell? Is it a flower? Yeah. Like white rose? Or it might symbolize a white rose. Yeah, we've got a white rose and a red rose, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the white rose and the red rose were whose symbols? Yes, the houses of Lancaster and York, right? And when Henry Tudor defeats Richard III and claims the throne as Henry VII, he adopts as his own emblem a white rose inside a red rose. So this round table that hangs in Winchester Castle is actually a forgery produced by Henry VIII's son, or by Henry VII's son, Henry VIII. The Tudors were very much invested in trying to write themselves into the Arthur myth, right? Because what do we remember again about the branch of the family the Tudors came from? Yeah, they came from an illegitimate line. Right? So early on <coughs> in their rule, they worked a lot to connect themselves to the Arthurian legends to try to give themselves a sense of greater legitimacy. For example, Henry VIII was never supposed to be king. He had an older brother whose name was, can you guess? Yep, Arthur. Now, Arthur Tudor was absolutely nothing like his uh, historical namesake. Um, he was um, sickly from birth and may actually, in fact, have uh, suffered from severe mental incapacities. Um, he didn't survive to adulthood. So his brother takes the throne, and takes the throne instead. Is this the Nine Wives guy? Hmm? Is this the guy with the Nine Wives? Uh, Six wives. Yeah, six, yeah. He had he had six wives, and at least one of them doesn't really count. Yes, he he only he only actually beheaded two of them. The other four died largely of natural causes. As natural as as natural causes anyway as anyone died of, in you know a European court in the 16th century. All right, so. Most of the historical evidence for King Arthur is shaky at best, right? So what we have really is a character that comes to us out of French romances, right? That's where the familiar figure of Arthur comes from. The familiar figure of Arthur, right, the, the noble king who rules over a court of loyal knights, Right, total fiction. So whose bodies were those? They just buried some random guy? And well, it, if there were really bodies at all, right? People sort of took the king's word for it, uh, right? It's good to be the king. <laughs> it's also, you know, it can also be good to be a king with a reputation for violence. Right, if any of you have seen, um, this movie is completely ahistorical and is 
for various reasons, uh, you know, for various reasons gives me a headache. But have any of you ever seen Braveheart? I watched it like last week. Okay, yeah, Edward the First is the English king in Braveheart. So if that gives you some sense. All right, so as I was saying, Arthur is largely a product of French romance and is typically not himself the hero in any of the stories centered on his court, right? Arthur is, not, is usually a pretty passive figure. Most of the French romances feature some untested knight <coughs> who goes off on an adventure wins a wife in an estate and then gets largely to retire from action. Right, so this is what like most of most of the knights we see in these romances, right, they really only get one big adventure. And then once they've achieved everything they need to achieve, they leave the scene and make room for other knights. Now in Chrétien's romances, there's an added sort of sub-theme here right, of you know competition. with Gawain or Govan, right? Arthur's nephew and best knight undertakes a parallel series of adventures to which our hero knight is then compared. Now, Mallory's text here, right? You know, he refers often in his own writing to the French book from which he took this. His source is a series of romances called the Vulgate Cycle. And the Vulgate Cycle is so called, is it, does the word Vulgate look familiar to anybody? If you take the T-E away and add an R, what have you got? Vulgar. Vulgar, yeah. What this means, like it doesn't mean that these are obscene. What it means is that these were written in prose, not in verse. Right? It's a series of French prose romances that Mallory adapts and translates, translates and adapts, um, sort of to suit his own times. Now, was there anything in this that you found sort of particularly surprising? Anything in this that you found sort of, you know, that you maybe didn't expect in a King Arthur story? How are we sort of culturally conditioned to think of King Arthur in the round table? That they're all like the best of friends, they all have each other's backs? Yeah, it's this, right, this, this kind of, you know, band of brothers, right? in bright, shiny armor. They all have each other's backs. And they all stand up for the highest of ideals, right? What do we get here instead? <coughs> Pardon? Yeah, how so? Uh, we have, they're supposed to be the closest to friends Uh, okay. He goes behind Arthur's back and starts sleeping with Guinevere. Uh huh. And betrays. <laughs> yeah. Has Guinevere. been doing so for some time, yeah. And then Gawain and all of them and his brothers uh, pretty much go against, or like mm -hmm. instigate the situation even further. Right. And then turn a big chasm, like just splits and uh -huh. up. And let's not forget to, right, you know, how are Gawain and his brothers related to King Arthur? Yeah, 
he's their uncle. And also, through bizarre accidents of history, Mordred's father, right? Though, you know, his level of awareness of this fact is often, um, you know, often varies from tale to tale. But yeah, so, Gawain and his brothers, right, there are quite a lot of them. Right, we have Gawain, Agravain, Gareth, Gaharis, and Mordred. Yeah, they're all related to the king. And here's this guy. He may be the best knight in Arthur's court. He may outwardly stand up for all these shining ideals. He may be a great warrior. But he's more or less publicly shaming their uncle, right? So the family squabble here takes precedence over the brotherhood of the round table, right? A lot of this factionalism is due to this family tie. Because indeed, what is it that turns Gawain against Lancelot finally? What does Lancelot do? Gawain doesn't want anything to do with Agravain and Mordred's plot, right? He kills his brothers. Yeah. Lancelot kills Gareth and Gaharis. And so Gawain becomes his implacable foe, right? Do we see any kind of historical analog going on here? Right, we have the unity of the nation broken up by factions based on family ties, right? Ultimately, these older ties, these kinship ties, seem to win out over ideals. So what? It just gets worse from there, basically. I mean, mm -hmm. as we can tell, the rest of them just about die, so Mordred ends up dead. <laughs> Yeah, Mordred and Arthur kill each other. Yeah. Right, now, this sort of brings us to another point, right? How does Arthur kill Mordred? Arthur has this famous sword, Excalibur, right? Which is, you know, sort of this symbol of authority that's given to him by the Lady of the Lake early in his career as king. Right. <clears throat> but, you know, as Monty Python tells us, Strange women lying in ponds deliver, uh, distributing swords is no basis for a system of governments. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't use this famous sword to kill Mordred, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He runs him through with a spear, and then Mordred pulls himself up the spear to smite Arthur on the head, right? So father and son kill each other. But so what that Arthur doesn't use the symbol of his authority, the symbol of his power as king, his power as king. <coughs> to smack down his way, his wayward nephew slash son. Why does he just run him through with a simple spear? Well, he's kind of lost control over everything, so he's lost his power in a way. Yeah, on the one, yeah, it, it does demonstrate, yeah, that he has, <clears throat> that, you know, his authority is eroded, right? His authority's gone. And in fact, he's then going to have Sir Bedivere hurl the sword into the lake to give it up once and for all, right? 
There's also, though, a difference in class here, right? You know, what sort of people would wield what sort of weapons? Yeah, Jessica, go ahead. Uh, mainly people like thieves or the lesser class would contain spears or daggers or, I mean, it's used usually for things you don't want. Like simple author authority, it's not yeah. opposite. A spear is a peasant weapon. Right? Knights don't wield spears. Right? Expendable people wield spears, right? The guys who you set to sort of stand in front of the line while the cavalry is charging at you, right? They're gonna, you know, they, they'll take some of those cavalry with them, but they're gonna get trampled. Spears are for peasants, not for kings. The sword is an aristocratic weapon. So how do we read that and the fact that he kills Mordred using a peasant weapon? What's the only other point in this uh, selection where we see peasants appearing to do anything? Yeah, if you look on page uh, 493, right? So Sir Lucan departed, for he was grievously wounded in many places. And so as he yeed, he saw and hearkened by the moonlight how the pillars and robbers were come into the field to pill and to rob many a full noble knight of brooches and bees and of many a good ring and many a rich jewel. And who, were not, who that were not dead all out there, they slew them for their harness and their riches. So the flower of Britain's nobility is lying out there on the field. And all of these pillars and robbers, right, these pillagers, looters, show up. And whichever knights are only wounded, they put them out of their misery. Whichever knights are dead, they simply take their stuff, right? So all of these riches, everything that indicates the status of these knights, is being stolen by people of low birth, right? These symbols of authority, these trappings of wealth, are going into the hands of mere peasants. Right, so the generation that is coming up is a lesser generation than that, than that which went before. Have we seen this kind of theme before in texts that we've looked at in this class? Where else have we seen this? Beowulf. Yeah, we've seen it in Beowulf, right? Certainly, like, yeah, the tone of Anglo-Saxon poetry is the sort of looking backward, right? The men who are now are not as good as those who were before. We saw some element of this in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as well, right? Part of the Green Knight's challenge to King Arthur's court, right, is that, you know, these guys aren't real fighters. These guys aren't real manly men, right? They like wearing fancy clothes and lying around in bed all day, love talking. They don't go on real adventures. They don't do anything of note, right? So in that particular text, like Gawain's generation is found wanting, right? So this is a pretty common thing, particularly in early in medieval British literature, right? This, I, this sort of nostalgic looking backwards to how good things used to be. And how good they could be again, right? What is the usual end point of the Arthur myth? Right, he dies on the battlefield, but then what's supposed to happen?
we look on page 495, Alas, said the king, help me hence, for I dread me I have tarried over long. Then Sir Bedivere took the king upon his back, and so went with him to that water's side. And when they were at the water's side, even fast by the bank hoved a large barge with many fair ladies in it, and among them all was a queen, and all they had black hoods, and all they wept and shrieked when they saw King Arthur. Now put me into that barge, said the king. And so he did softly. And there received him three ladies with great mourning, and so they set him down. And in one of their laps King Arthur laid his head, and then the queen said, Ah, my dear brother, why have ye tarried so long from me? Alas, this wound on your head hath caught over much cold. And anon they rode fromward the land, and Sir Bedivere beheld all the ladies go forward from him. Then Sir Bedivere cried and said, Ah, my lord Arthur, what shall become of me now? Now ye go from me and leave me here among mine enemies. Comfort thyself, said the king, and do as well as thou mayst, for in me is no trust for to trust in. For I must into the vale of Avilion to heal me of my grievous wound, and if thou never hear never more of me, pray for my soul. So what's supposed to happen at the end of the Arthur story? Right, he is often referred to in sort of British popular culture as the once and future king. Why? What is this supposed to indicate to us? He's supposed to be like immortal. Yeah, he's supposed to come back, right? He's sent off to Avalon to be cured of his wounds. He's supposed to come back and make Britain great again, right? In the you know the great in Britain's greatest time of need, Arthur is supposed to return and set everything to rights. Does Mallory seem to believe in this myth? Why would you say, why would you say no, Jessica? Well, we can tell by, at the very end of that section, uh -huh. they kind of weep, they don't really, I mean, of course they pray for him, but they kind of believe he's not coming back. Yeah. The way they speak. And if we look here, as the ladies weep and shriek, right, as Sir Bedivere Loth had lost sight of the barge, he wept and wailed, and so took the forest, and went all that night. And in the morning he was where betwixt two holds whore of a chapel and an hermitage. Thus of Arthur I find no more written books that have been authorized. Neither more the very certainty of his death heard I never read. But thus was he led away in a ship wherein were three queens, that one was King Arthur's sister, Queen Morgan Le Fay, the other was the Queen of North Wales, and the third was the Queen of the Wastelands. Now more of the death of Arthur could I never find, but that these ladies brought him to his burials. And such one was buried there that the hermit bore witness that sometimes was Bishop of Canterbury. So Mallory seems to believe in Arthur's actual death, right? He's not coming back. There is no once and future king who's going to come back and correct everything and fix everything. Now, why might how the times Mallory lived in sort of suit him to this kind of pessimistic interpretation of the Arthur myth? Well, what's going on through most of Mallory's adult life? The war. Yeah the British royal family cutting each other to pieces. Well, like, now they decided really won. Yeah. It sort of took an outsider yeah. to come in and end the war. And this is the sort of thing that Henry Tudor will then promote in his own family line, right? That we are the return of Arthur. We'll see um, when we look at Elizabethan literature, right, how Henry VIII's daughter adapts Arthurian imagery to further the idea that the Tudor line themselves are the second coming of Arthur. 
Yeah, the fact of the matter is, you know, this, this is a myth that various British royal lines have put to use for their own political purposes over time. Right? It is politically very, very useful right, to connect yourself to this legendary king who probably never existed. And is largely simply the product of chivalric romance. But there's one thing um, here that we haven't discussed that I do want to hit on when we still have time. What's going on with Sir Bedivere and the sword, right? We've talked about the sword here as the kind of the symbol of authority. Right? This is the symbol of Arthur's kingship. And Arthur commands that Sir Bedivere throw it away. Right? Take it to the lake, throw it in, then come back and tell me what you see. If you look on page 494, right, my lord said Sir Bedivere, your commandment shall be done, and I shall lightly bring you word again. So Sir Bedivere departed, and by the way he beheld that noble sword, that the pommel and the haft was all precious stones. And then he said to himself, If I throw this rich sword in the water, thereof shall never come good but harm and loss. And then Sir Bedivere hit Excalibur under a tree. And so, as soon as he might, he came again unto the king, and said he had been at the water and had thrown the sword into the water. And then he, you know, he's asked what he saw, and he says, Well, nothing. And the king knows he's lying. Right? You didn't throw the sword into the water. What is it that has tempted him here? Why has he hidden the sword away? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sword is a symbol of power and of the you know the king's power in particular, right? So maybe he can keep it. I don't know. Maybe he's thinking about that. Yeah, if we look at you know the. That noble sword, the pommel and the half, was all precious stones, right? What have we seen the pillagers running around picking off of all of the dead knights? All of their riches and jewels, right? And all of their war gear, right? So he's tempted here, apparently in a way that is rather similar to these peasant pillagers. So he takes the sword and hides it. Right, page 495. Then Sir Bedivere departed and went to the sword and lightly took it up. And so he went to the water side, and there he bound the girdle about the hilts and threw the sword as far into the water as he might. And there came an arm and a hand above the water and took it and clutched it and shook it thrice and brandished. And then vanished away the hand with the sword into the water. So in order to get King Arthur the boat to take him away, what does Bedivere have to be willing to sacrifice? I mean, the boat is going to come to clean up, to heal Arthur of his wounds, right? He has to give what he has or has had during his lifetime in order to go back to get healed. Yeah, the king's authority must be given up here, right? The king's authority over the land has to be tossed back into the lake, given back to the source of that authority. Right? It's the lady of the lake that gives him the sword in the first place. But because Bedivere waited too long to do it, the wound has caught over much cold, right? And there will be no healing for Arthur. There will be no once in future king. 
So Arthur's reign is just going to be a memory of a past golden age. There isn't going to be a glorious Arthurian future. Because Bedivere was unwilling to let go of the sword. Now, is it because he's unwilling to let go of his king? Is it because he's unwilling to let go of the privileges that come along with being one of the king's chief knights? That's another question. But it does seem that ultimately yeah, it's his failure to throw the sword in that dooms Arthur to die. Okay, anybody have any questions about any of this? So this material is going to come up again and again and again. This is sort of one of the central myths of British identity, particularly sort of British royal authority. So it's going to come. It's going to come up when we talk about the Tudors and Tudor literature. It's also going to be a pretty big deal for the Victorians when we get sort of closer to the end of the course. Um, so don't forget this stuff. So I do have uh, some reading questions for you for next time. We're going to be looking at um, some speeches and poems and letters uh, written by Elizabeth I. So Elizabeth I as author rather than as simply historical figure. And don't forget to turn your in-class writing as you go.